I, I hope you have come to know that on the last Sunday of each month, what we do is remind ourselves that we belong to something much, much bigger than we find here in Germantown, that there's a church in Egypt, there's a church in Germany, there's a church in Russia, there's a church in China, there's a church in Taiwan, and, and we hold certain things in common. Um, the Christian church is a creedal church, ladies and gentlemen. It's not that we feel the same things, but we believe the same things. And much of what we believe is, it is summarized in creeds. One that seems to be the best is what's called the Apostles' Creed. And so once a month, we stand together to recite those things that we believe. So stand with me if you will. So tell me, my brother and sister in Christ, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. It seems to be incumbent upon me every week or every month to say that you're not expressing a belief in the Roman Catholic Church. The word Catholic simply means universal. I believe in the Catholic Church, the universality of the Christian church. And the other thing that seems to trouble people is this descent into hell. We're not saying that Jesus Christ descended there locationally. What we're saying is that he experienced hell while on the cross and he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Ladies and gentlemen, that's what hell is, the forsakenness of God. Now, grab your Bibles, if you will, and open them to 1 Corinthians 15, and let's continue our little study, our little series on the chapter that's called the Resurrection Chapter, we're doing our Easter homework uh, before Easter so that we can do something maybe a little bit different come Easter Sunday morning. So uh, you follow as I read, beginning uh, at verse 35. Ladies and gentlemen, the only inerrant thing you will hear this morning is what I'm about to read, so stay tuned. It reads like this. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for stars differ from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of, of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God, that, that word, it endures forever. 
Folks, what you have here in these three paragraphs is a, is a parenthesis to Paul's main argument. You know, this whole chapter is about resurrection, but um, in, in the course of his making his case for the resurrection, uh, either he anticipates, I think that's what it is, he anticipates that his audience has a question. And so he addresses the question before they ask it. The question is, how? How is this all going to happen? And so Paul pauses in his argument uh, to establish the resurrection to address that question. Folks, I, I don't know of another passage like this in all of the Bible. This is, this is unique in so many ways. For one, you'll notice that Jesus Christ is called Adam. No place else is he ever called Adam. And by the way, he's not called the second Adam because that would imply there might be a third. No, he's called the last Adam. There's only two, the one in the garden over the covenant of works and this one over the covenant of grace is the last Adam. And then in so much of this, this, these three little paragraphs, Jesus is not mentioned at all. It's a, it's a very unique, interesting little uh, section of Scripture where he is trying to help Christians um, wrap their minds around this whole thing called resurrection. When Paul wrote this, folks, this idea of resurrection was unique to Christianity. Now, immortality, that was a, a common theme in, in other religions, but not resurrection. And so Paul, knowing how difficult it is for us to fathom this whole thing, and, and by the way, I would add, it's even harder for us, we 21st century modern sophisticated minds. So knowing that it, it is hard, he pauses to answer what I think is a very legitimate question. He calls them foolish people, but I think this is a, a very little legitimate question about how. You see, by instinct, we, we all grasp for immortality. And if you don't believe that's true, then I ask you to just go attend a funeral, any funeral, and listen to the conversations that are being had. Oh, he's in the better place. Well, maybe. But we want this thing called immortality. But we're told by sophisticates that we can't have it. Well, Paul has already made his argument, but now he's going to set his argument aside for the moment as he addresses a question on the minds of his listeners. The question is, how? How is this going to happen? To answer that question, he draws from the world of agriculture. By the way, Jesus does the same thing in John 12. He talks about a grain of wheat falling into the ground and it has to die, etc. Well, that's the same argument in John 12 that Paul uses here in 1 Corinthians 15. He says a seed, a grain of wheat, uh, or some other crop, when it's placed into the soil and then it dies, it then erupts into this <coughs> whole new thing. That which science tells us is impossible happens all the time in nature. Um, it, is a, it is nature that supplies the answer to the question of his audience, how? Well, how? Well, just like when a seed once dropped into the ground and dies it comes up with this whole new body from God. Now, ladies and gentlemen, pause with me right there. I want you to notice this statement in verse 38. But God gives it a new body. Folks, that which you see in operation in nature is not mother nature. That's, a, that's, that's huge in this passage, folks. You see, um, this is not to be attributed 
to some kind of unknown force. God did that. It's one of those passages that Martin Lloyd-Jones loves to spend time on because he says there's so much theology in conjunctions, but, yada, 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 but, but God, but God gives it a new body. Now, guys, um, do you know what I'm holding? I'm holding an oak tree. Actually, I'm holding three oak trees. Are you impressed? Well, um, because this is the beginning of an oak tree. I must have raked up three million of these things in my yard yesterday. I mean, it was either three or four million. I forgot. But um, this is a seed, ladies and gentlemen that when placed in the ground and dies, it bursts forth into this enormous thing that's, at least in my yard, is sitting right next to the driveway that if it falls on my house, it will destroy my house. And it all came from this. You know, I remember my wife, bless her dear heart, um, my wife loves um, cut flowers in the summertime. She likes to me to raise flowers so that she can cut them, you know, and bring them inside and decorate the house, etc. With all the spiders that are there, and then she complains about the spiders in our house. Um, but I remember the first time I I planted zinnias, and I took I bought this little package of zinnias at at Walmart, and I um, I, I tore off the top. And I poured the contents of the little package into my hand. And I looked at that and I thought, I've been robbed. What do you mean? I mean, that's just a bunch of husk, these gossamer little things. That, By the way, if I were to blow on this, I, I would scatter this all over the place. You mean to tell me? Now, of course, I'd never planted any before. You mean to tell me that that's, that's what... Zinnias come from those pretty little flowers that I bring in with the with the spiders. So I thought, well, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. I got this little patch in the in the back of my yard, and some years it really produces nice set of flowers. Uh, last year was a bad year, um, but I'm going to try again. So I planted these things, this little, and um, lo and behold, I ended up with some zinnias. Because you see, um, in this little ugly thing that ain't worth, I wish you could see it. You can't, but you see it? (laughs) There's a zinnia in there. Folks, That's the argument of these three paragraphs in 1 Corinthians 15. God takes these little seeds and he gives to them a new body. Gang, the fundamental answer to the question that was asked, how, that's in, you saw that, didn't you? In verse 35, but someone will ask, how? The fundamental answer to the question that was asked right there is to be answered from the world of seeds and plants. The possibility of resurrection for us is based on the same activity of God Don't you assign that to Mother Nature. That same activity that goes on here is the activity of God to bring back to life in a different and improved way 
when we die. There is a, there is a continuity of personality called the soul or suke, but the body that comes out of this seed, oh, my, my. It is so different, and yet, it's precisely the same. Folks, what we're told to be impossible happens every day in the world of nature. Now, gang, there, there, are, there are several lessons that I'd like to draw from these little three paragraphs that comprise this um, parenthesis. Let me mention several things drawing just from his illustration. Number one, you'll read in verses 39 through 41 that there is such a diversity in seeds. Oh, there's one for the, you know, there's one for humans, there's one for birds, there's one for fish, there's one for the sun. Just all kinds of diversity of, of seeds, uh, of bodies. An acorn, these two things are very, very different. But they undergo the same process. The same thing that happened lost the dog. Um, The same thing that happens to my zinnia seed happens to this acorn. Now, folks, life is full of limitless variety, just as you see in the body of Christ, in the church. There's nothing monotonous about our God. There's a multitude of seeds and a multitude of plants And that variety that exists among plants that also exists among people is not to be despised. Oh, no. It's to be celebrated. You know what, ladies and gentlemen? Some of you are really weird. But hallelujah. You wouldn't want to have a heaven filled with a bunch of Jimmy Youngs. I promise you, you wouldn't. But one of the things that you can derive out of this this analogy that Paul is using is the celebratory diversity that exists among us. That's a good thing, not bad. Secondly, the vast difference in the seed and the plant. There is a vast difference between that and the oak tree on the side of my driveway. Vast difference. Um, But once this is placed into the ground and and it dies, um, it produces this other thing that is so much different than this, but that other thing is right inside here. Folks, um, this seed, my body, Um, that differs from yours goes into the ground it is sown in dishonor sown in corruption but once it dies it resurrects into something so wonderful. 
Folks, the body has got to die. But the, the hidden life that is within this body springs into existence and all of that ladies and gentlemen you listen to me all of that is directed by God not by mother nature in agriculture no the same activity that you see him exercising over the world of nature in a similar activity is going to be applied to me. And I'm going to come out better. Here's the third lesson, folks. <clears throat> I said better Oh, ladies and gentlemen, that oak tree on the side of my, my, my driveway is a vast improvement over this. Hey, if you'd, like to, if you'd like to see the magnitude of the improvement, just come by this afternoon and pull up in the driveway. And would you take a few of these with you? But please don't come by my house this afternoon. I'll be in it. You'll wake me up. But um, the, the point is, the thing that it produces, the same thing that the seed produced is such an improvement over the old one. Folks, the old one, the old one was made to die. This body is not man. It's, it's his house. It's his heaven. That oak tree, he's just living in here temporarily until he dies. And then God is going to give him a new body. This house is going to go away. And this new thing is vastly better. Folks, we are not bodies with souls. We're souls with bodies. And this body is intended to die. But the new one, oh, the new one, it's made for eternity with a whole new set of possibilities. Folks, the message of these three little parables, of these three little paragraphs, is that nature authenticates a principle that has to do with the resurrection, our resurrection from the dead. The God of nature is the God of resurrection. He will do to me what he does with a plant. Mother Nature didn't do that, ladies and gentlemen. Right here, verse 38. But God gives it a new body. He gives this a new body. And he gives this a new body. Folks, did you notice um, verse 40? Um, heavenly bodies, earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly body is one kind. The glory of the earthly is another. The glory of the sun is then the glory of the moon and the glory of the stars and the glory of different glory. 
Folks, there's two glories. There's the glory of this earthly fallen body, but there's another glory, an improved glory in the resurrected one. One glory tends towards randomness. It's called the second law of thermodynamics. It's the law of entropy. In fact, Paul, and I, I, I found this funny, but Paul in Philippians 3 calls this vile. <laughs> you know that thing that you spend three hours on to fix up? Paul calls it vile. And I want you to notice that language in 41 and 40 and 41. It is sown, it is raised. It is sown, it is raised. It is sown, it is raised. This was sown. And then it awaits to be raised. And at that point, ladies and gentlemen, eternity sets in. Now, one, one other item and, and I'm done. I want you to look at the last verse, that verse 49 with me. Um, Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, that was Adam, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven, which is Christ. Gang, one of the uniquenesses of Christianity is that we are told that we are going to bear the image of Christ. Now, what all does that include? I don't know. But I can tell you this much. No Muslim is ever told that he's going to bear the image of Muhammad. He's told he's going to inherit 70 virgins. You know, it seems to me they ought to be running out of virgins by now, but um, um, no Buddhist is ever told that he's going to bear the image of Buddha. But folks, all of this that is being discussed in these three paragraphs, including this image thing, that all belongs to those who belong to the last Adam, not the second Adam, folks. There ain't no third one. You belong to that Adam, this man of heaven, and you can expect all of these things to happen to you. All of this is received through belonging to the last Adam. Folks, the non-Christian will rise but he won't be bearing this image. God is pleased to bring life out of death. Following death comes resurrection. This is going to be put away. And out of it is going to come something that we're going to enjoy forever. But if you are here and you are outside of Jesus Christ, there is no image. There is no peace of God for you. There is no forgiveness of sin for you. There is no heaven for you. You see, all of that belongs only 
to those who belong to the last Adam. <laughs>